Hello and welcome to this episode of the ASHA podcast. I'm Fred Wine with the American Sexual Health Association, ASHA. With this episode, we're continuing our deep dive on trichomoniasis, trick. And we really believe this is worth exploring. Trick is the most common non-viral sexually transmitted infection in the US, but it's one that a lot of people aren't familiar with. Um, the trick is, it's caused by a parasite, a, a, a protozoa called Trichomonas vaginalis, if you want to look it up. Estimates peg incidents in the U.S. at around 2 million cases, often without obvious symptoms, but the trick can still have some very real health impacts. So we're going to talk about all that today um, and how trick is treated with our very special guest, Dr. Patty Kissinger. Patty Kissinger, hello. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me, Fred. Appreciate yeah, it. This is, Asha. This is- yeah, absolutely. And uh, it, this is long overdue. It's our first time that we've had you on the podcast. We're really excited about this. And Dr. Kissinger is an infectious disease epidemiologist and professor at Tulane University School of Public Health and Tropical Medicine. She's also the Associate Dean of Faculty Affairs. And since you are uh, so close to the French Quarter, I'll say merci beaucoup for serving as a list du jour. Laissez les bons temps rouler. All right, so let me dive right in. All right. Uh, so I mentioned in the preamble that um, trick can have some pretty significant health outcomes. So if it's undiagnosed and untreated, what can happen with this infection? Yes. So if it's und, and most people are asymptomatic, so they don't know they have it, and uh, so you really need to screen for it. But the people who are symptomatic or the people that actually have sequelae, um, for uh, it's probably more severe for women. Men might have. Uh, a urethritis, they might have prostatitis, but women, uh, particularly pregnant women, it can cause um, premature rupture of membranes, uh, small for gestational age, it can cause uh, uh, low birth weight and premature, preterm delivery. So it does have pretty significant consequences in pregnant women, pregnant people. Um, also, the other thing that uh, there have been several meta-analyses that have come out that have demonstrated that uh, it amplifies your uh, uh, risk for HIV acquisition. And so more, if if you're not, if you don't have HIV and you have trichomonas, you're at higher risk for getting HIV. Mm. Yeah, and we talk about that, I know with a number of of STIs, they can increase, like herpes increases your HIV risk. So that's, I think a really important uh, uh, point here. Um, and you mentioned uh, the fact that so many cases are without symptoms. I mean, that's true in someone who's pregnant. They just may not even know they have it. Right. And if people don't screen for it. So there are no recommendations for screening, though uh, pregnant women should be screened, but there, there, there are no, it's not a reportable disease in the United States or really worldwide. It's not a reportable disease. Um, it's variously screened for or not screened for. So uh, usually pregnant people should be tested for it because the outcomes are so bad. And HIV infected women should also be screened for it because uh, it, it is a very high prevalence in HIV infected women mm-hmm. or people that have vaginas. All right, so when trick is diagnosed, what medications, what are the regimens for, for, for treating it? Yeah, so for about 60 years, they've used metronidazole as a treatment for trichomonas and um, they, uh, started with multi-dose and then in the 1970s there was a push towards getting single dose therapies because people were uh, you know uh, tired of um, the adherence issue. So um, there was a series of very small studies that demonstrated that uh, the two gram dose was equivalent to the seven gram dose or the seven seven day dose. And um, so that the recommendations got changed and two gram was the preferred dose and uh, the seven day dose was the secondary. Well, um, we did a meta-analysis and we also did randomized trial in HIV positive and HIV infected and HIV uninfected women. And we found that uh, the single dose was not adequate. We had much twofold higher breakthrough rates with the two gram compared to the seven gram. So now CDC and WHO recommends multi-dose of metronidazole to treat uh, uh, trichomonas. So it's actually 500 milligrams twice daily for seven days. Any differences in the the treatment recommendations by biological gender? Yes, because the studies were done in women or 
women who are assigned, at, uh, people that are assigned women at birth, uh, we do not have very much data on men. And so we are hoping to embark upon a randomized trial. We're doing a pilot work right now to see if uh, these recommendations should be extended to men. So for men right now, the recommendation is still the two gram single dose medication for men. What about side effects These with, with, with these medications? Any problems there? Does that maybe impact adherence? Well, yeah, metronidazole is not most, the most pleasant medication to take. It's a class B, so it's okay to take in pregnancy. It's actually metronidazole itself is okay to take when you're breastfeeding, but it, it, it can give you a metallic taste. Some people get a little upset stomach and, um, and some people get nothing in it at all, but those can be uh, the, uh, gas, you know, the nausea and vomiting and, and, and can be a, a, sometimes you find that. Sure. And, and, and metronidazole is not the only medication. There's, a, it's the class of nitroimidazoles. So there's also, besides metronidazole, there's also tinidazole. And then just recently for women, they came out with a randomized trial. I think it was Dr. Mosny, Christina Mosny at UAB. They came out with a uh, randomized trial on secnidazole. So that can also be taken. And tinidazole has less side effects, but it's 10 times more expensive uh, than metronidazole. And also tinidazole cannot be given to pregnant women or lactating women. Secnidazole has not been studied in pregnancy at all, so it's not recommended to give secnidazole in pregnancy at all. All right, that leads to my next question. I was gonna ask you about treatment during pregnancy. Oh, I jumped the gun. No, you're fine. <laughs> Perfect segue. Yeah. So, um, so treatment in pregnancy, yeah. um, women who are pregnant, it's, it's the best practice. It's a good idea to screen all of them. Um, and then if they are, uh, if they're test positive for trichomonas, they should be given the seven day dose, 500 milligrams twice daily for seven days. And their sexual partner should also be treated with, uh, if it's a male, two grams of, um, uh, of metronidazole. And they should not be given tinidazole or cyclinidazole because it's, it, those are class C drugs and, or, or have been unstudied in the case of cyclinidazole. And in general, how well do these treatment regimens work? I mean, will they pretty much cure trick? Well, that is a very interesting thing. Even in the case when, even if you're using the seven day dose of metronidazole, we still get about an 8% breakthrough rate, which is really unacceptable in any STI to have an 8% breakthrough rate. So one of the things, what we're not really sure why there's such a high breakthrough rate even if you give the multi-dose. And there is some thought that it may have something to do with the host because when they look at the, the organism itself and do susceptibility testing, they really find most of it is susceptible to um, metronidazole. It's about 4% uh, have mild to moderate uh, resistance. And so really it's gotta have something to do with the host. So it could be the vaginal milieu. There could be something to do with co-occurrence of bacterial vaginosis, which about 50% of women who have trichomonas will also have bacterial vaginosis. So there's something maybe in the host uh, or in the vaginal milieu or co-infections with other uh, organisms that may be interfering with um, the ability to treat that trichomonas adequately. So the good news is 92% of people will clear it, but it's that 8% that's kind of tenacious. Back in the Stone Age, when I first started talking about these issues, there was a prescription gel. Is that still part of the treatment mix? Yes, there are some gels. So um, they, they're not recommended as first line. So if a person fails, what they'll probably do is give them another seven day dose. If they fail again, then they may go to paraminis, uh, paraminicin, which is a nightly cream that can, can be given. They can also, uh, some people, they have, have been some success with boric acid. Um, but these, uh, both of these have to be compounded at a special pharmacy. And so it's not very easy to get these. Yeah. It's not, so it's not done very much. Or if a person has hypersensitivity, they're going to have to do some hypersensitivity, you know, a desensitization. Um, but for the most part, uh, the oral medicines are used uh, more frequent, far more frequently. Okay, that makes sense. So I want to ask you about partner management issues. And I, I read on the CDC site that one in five people with TRIC are infected again within three months after treatment. So does this mean we need 
better therapeutic options? Do we just need to do a better job of treating partners and follow-up testing? How do we how do we sort that out? Yeah. So about 15 to 20% of those repeat infections are actually um, a partner getting them re re-giving it to them. So it is really important that we give expedited partner treatment so that or or some form of partner treatment um, so that you can clear it out. It's it's not controversial, but there have been some studies that said men that demonstrate that men clear the infection, like about 30% of men might clear the infection spontaneously without any medication, but you don't know that for sure. And um, what we do know is in, pre in um, infected women, 70% of their sexual partners are also infected. So it's a pretty good bet uh, that they are infected. And so it is a really good idea and it, it's best practices and CDC and WHA recommend partners be treated. So and, and the partner would be treated with two grams of metronidazole. Got it, okay, great. It, and, and it's good that there are clear guidelines there. It doesn't sound like there's any ambiguity. So um, yeah, it's just a matter of, I guess, getting the diagnosis in the first place. So. Yeah, that that is that is the thing. Getting di the diagnosis is getting people to uh, because it's not uh, reportable and because there are no recommendations for broad screening of trichomonas. It's really uh, depends on the provider themselves ordering a test. And so now there's been and I don't know if you're going to ask me this, um, but there's been a proliferation of all sorts of different tests. Um, all these oh, new plague. These nucleic acid uh, tests and also point of care tests. We now have four uh, point of care tests, soon to be, I think, more than that. But um, point of care is really great because you can then you, you can do better antimicrobial stewardship because you know, you know that they have it. Um, and so, but they're very expensive. But um, yeah, the NAT testing is highly sensitive and specific. And uh, we just got to get people to use it so that we can screen them. So I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that. So, so uh, repeating again, my reference of my own stone age uh, uh, gestation. So when I first started talking about this and diagnostics, a lot of it was around wet mounts yeah. and around cultures, but we've moved forward quite a bit. We have these molecular tests, the mm -hmm. nucleic acid amplification test, NATS. Mm -hmm. And uh, you've just mentioned they are very sensitive, uh, very specific. And so it sounds like we really, the, the technology has evolved um, is incredibly. And this is kind of a good thing. Like, I mean, more and more of STIs, right? We're talking about you know, molecular testing, like with HPV mm -hmm. and, and on and on, so. Yeah, so, so the standard of care prior to the um, implementation or the, uh, the introduction of NAT testing was uh, wet prep or wet mount. And about, you miss about half of the infection when you do that. It depends on the expertise of the provider. Some people are really great and some people are not as good, probably depending on the volume of how many patients you see. But we, um, wet prep is, is nice because it is point of care and it's cheap, but it also does take time away from the provider. Um, and, 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 and it's about 50% inaccurate or you know, you'll miss 50% of them. So yeah. um, uh, the NAT testing is far more sensitive and specific. What, it, what is a phenomenon that uh, we have to look at in research is that now with NAT testing, we're picking up a lot of uh, asymptomatic trichomonas and we don't, we're not 100% sure if it's important to treat this asymptomatic trichomonas. We think it is, but most of the research has been done on symptomatic uh, persons who are symptomatic with trichomonas. So that need, that's a study that needs to be done. Yeah, it sounds like it. So uh, you touched on rapid point of care tests, and that's also part of this whole new wave of technology. Would you just talk about that for a bit? I, I mean, what, what's the benefit to patients of this? So the benefit to patients for point of care tests is a more rapid diagnosis. So if you don't do wet prep and you send out uh, for a NAT test, you have to wait for several days for the results to come back usually. And so by that time, the, part, the patient is long gone and either you've treated them uh, you know, syndromically or you haven't treated them. And uh, then there's more burden for the patient to have to come back and get the medicine or go to the pharmacy and get the medicine or they've waited for extra days without being treated. So the benefit of these point of care tests is that a uh, the clinician can know right away and then provide the 
the accurate medicine for them, um, the patient can get treated quicker and doesn't have the burden of having to come back. So that, that is the benefit. Now, most of these uh, point of care tests have been only studying in women. There's a couple of them that have been studied in men, but um, I think that they have greater sensitivity in women and some of them require a vaginal specimen. Some of them are okay with the urine testing. Urine testing is of course far easier because a, you know, sort of semi lay person could do that. Uh, but to do a vaginal, uh, you know, a speculum or a vaginal examination is a little bit more complicated. So, getting those quick results, that makes perfect sense. You know, you can get a treatment plan together pretty much right away. And I'm, I suspect that would increase the, the adherence, the compliance, and just better outcomes from, for everybody. Definitely. Yeah. Okay. So, I want to ask you about what. You think we ought to, if we had a multi-million dollar marketing budget, Dr. Kissinger, what would we want to do in terms of educating clinicians and patients? And I'll start with patients. So we know trick is common, but it's under the radar, often asymptomatic. What do we need to tell the public about this infection? So the public needs to know that it does cause serious reproductive outcomes, particularly in women, but there are some in men, as I mentioned, the urethritis and the prostatitis. Um, it also, as I mentioned, amplifies the potential that you can acquire HIV if you're HIV uninfected. Um, so it's, it's it, and, and then if you're a pregnant person, it's really important that you get screened because of these. We now, we just did a second meta-analysis. Uh, Silver did one and then uh, Libby Van Gerwen and our group did another one and very consistently finding that it causes these uh, perinatal, perinatal outcomes. Uh, poor per perinatal outcomes. So the population needs to, or we hope that they would start to understand it. It is a, a sexually acquired infection and it needs to be taken care of. It needs to be treated. Um, and, and providers need to, um, it used to be considered sort of a nuisance uh, infection. Yeah. People were like, oh, it's there. It's maybe it's commensal. We don't really care that much about it. But then when we started to gain more understanding that it causes these reproductive outcomes, then people started to get a little bit more serious about it, but um, we really need more uh, of the public to be uh, to understand that this is something that uh, needs to be screened for and treated. So we'll go with uh, so with the provider piece. I think we'll go back to something that 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 you touched on uh, earlier: the proliferation of diagnostic options. They're great, the, the, mm -hmm. all of these new tests and things, but it's just more to sort of master, more to think about. You know, and I don't know what kind of algorithms we have about which test to use and which population and when to do it. I, or, uh, you know, I'll let you speak to that, but it sounds like that's, that's a big piece of the provider education. Yes. So pretty much any of the FDA approved nucle nucleic acid tests for trichomonas, are, they're all very highly sensitive, very specific. You may get a few false positives if the prevalence in your community is very low, but um, it, it, I would say that for the most part, it is um, they're they're very. It doesn't matter which one you use as long as they're FDA approved. Um, and the same thing, pretty much for the point of care tests, it doesn't matter. It just depends on what you can afford and what what you want to use. Some some of the point of care tests are take only ten minutes. Some of them take ninety minutes. So you have to consider that into your decision making process. Um, so I think that uh, it wouldn't matter which one you took as long as it was, it was an approved one. And in the STI, the CDC STD or STI treatment guidelines, we have, we have listed them uh, and you, know, you can look and choose which one is best for you, your situation. Let me ask one, one last thing. I, I, I was working on a chlamydia project a few years ago and one of the, I came across some survey data that indicated a lot of times clinicians aren't testing because they have a bias that their patient population is really not at risk. Chlamydia may happen more so in, their, in other groups, but not theirs. Do you think there's, have you noticed anything like that with, with TRIC, any sort of bias? Or? Absolutely. Yeah. So what happens is because it's not screened for and women can have it and it can be harbored you know, in their vaginal cavity for a long time without any symptoms and they don't know they have it. So this is about the only STI that you will see the prevalence is actually higher in older women. But if you look, but studies have been done in, in, in teenagers and they're seeing it in teenagers as well. So um, I think what happens is that because people don't get screened, they get detected much later. 
And so uh, it really is important to screen uh, anybody who's, uh, you know, any person, any, any uh, woman or person with a vagina, for sure. Thank you for mentioning the, uh, uh, the, the fact that teenagers can be impacted here. I didn't even think to ask anything about, you know, the distribution of TRIP across the life, uh, lifespan. So there's just a, a lot to think about. Um, yeah, I mean, it's hard to look at TRIP in a really narrow si silo. So I appreciate you for expanding our conversation to talk about uh, some things beyond treatment. I mean, tr treatment is, is one thing that you've got the partner communication piece, you've got uh, just the, the, you know, the, the education piece for the patient. I mean, there's just a lot of ground to cover. So thank you for indulging me as I kind of zigzagged everywhere. So, all right. yeah, so um, there was um, a paper that was done about 10 years ago uh, saying, uh, talking about should TRIP be um, it was by Hoots et al. And should it be a reportable disease? And they looked at the criteria and they, they came to the uh, conclusion that it didn't need to be. But we're in the middle, uh, a couple of investigators and I are in the middle of redoing that evaluation now that we have more data on the negative outcomes of trichomonas to see if we can. And, and I think right now it looks like more like we would recommend it to be screened. Um, and more widely, particularly in, in pregnant persons yeah, and HIV yeah. infected persons. Sure, sure. And would you mind, just, just for <clears throat> listeners who may not be familiar, what, what do you mean by a reportable disease? Reportable. Oh, sure. So um, infectious diseases are, uh, there are certain diseases that by the hygiene code of the jurisdiction or by CDC, they recommend and, and mandate that you report it. So HIV is one of them, syphilis is one of them, uh, chlamydia gonorrhea, um, and, 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 you know, like Ebola and things like that. Mm -hmm. But, um, but uh, trichomonas does not figure into that. And there are some other STIs that don't, herpes doesn't figure into it. Uh, HPV doesn't figure into it. But trichomonas is one that, so HPV and, and herpes are different because they're viral and, you know, you can't really cure them. But with trichomonas, you can cure it 92% of the time. So it's really important that, uh, Person, you know, people do get screened for it so that you can uh, give them the medicine and, and cure it. Dr. Patty Kessinger, thank you so much. This was really fascinating, and I hope you don't mind. And maybe I'll come back to you some point down the road as things change and get your insights again, because I think this is definitely worth paying attention to. Thank you so much. Thank you, Fred. You know, trichomonas is really a neglected STI, and um, I, when I was a junior investigator, I didn't even know about it. And it was Dr. Ned Hook that said, why aren't people worried about trichomonas vaginalis? And I said, I'll be worried about it. And so for the rest of my career, I've been working on it. And um, so I really feel like it needs to, you know, and we're going to see the same thing with mycoplasm genitalium. Mm -hmm. um, they, they're out there. We can't ignore them. And so we, I think if we can consider what, you know, and we have to be you know, thoughtful because CDC can't just screen for every STD that ever, you know, they can't recommend screening for every STD that right. was ever out there. But I think we can find certain people that might need to be screened. And so that would be my hope. Very good. Thank you again so much. To all the listeners, thank you too. You're the reason we do this. So please keep checking back and we'll have more podcast episodes rolling back. Send us feedback, info at ashesexualhealth.org. Until then, I'm Fredo with Asha. Take care, everybody.